Welcome. Everything is Bonzer. You're listening to Fork and Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. And I'm Jason. What were the architects of your journey into the afterlife? Today we're talking about Season 3, Episode 1 and 2, Everything is Bonzer. It was written by Jen Statsky and Michael Schur, directed by Dean Holland, and it aired September 27th, 2018. We're really excited to be back, and we have a lot to say this episode, so let's get right into it. The four humans have been sent back to Earth. The doorman grants Michael access to Earth, where he goes to save everyone from their accidental deaths. His mind reels at the wonders of Earth, and he shares his joy with Janet. All right, so we're into our first episode. Boom. Weird, long, dark hallway thing, and a doorman, who's not amused at all by Michael, but loves frogs, which I think is cute. Yeah, and it's clear that Michael has never been here before, just in the fact that He's looking around in amazement at everything, like Michael does. Yeah, a part of the universe he's never been privy to. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. I just really love Michael's enthusiasm about complete mundanity. It's just super infectious. Like, I feel excited about him potentially sitting sideways on a bus or getting to see this, like, Taco Bell and a Pizza Hut together, Mm -hmm. right? Like, he's just so excited about the most boring stuff i know right i could watch a show about michael like staring in wonder (laughs) at things walking down the street looking at everything like oh my goodness this is amazing what are they gonna think of next this is so wild oh my goodness what is that that's a piece (laughs) of gum on the ground holy smokes nobody chewed it (laughs) look at that it's a hot dog cart like freaking out (laughs) exactly i think it'd be fun so immediately we pretty much established that what's going on on earth is not a simulation it's not Mm -hmm. another test it's legit a new reality yeah so michael sure i I know he said this a few months ago in an interview he just straight up told people like yeah this is not a test this is real so people would stop trying to come up with all these crazy theories (laughs) i'm sure (laughs) he heard the podcast and he was like, no, no, Jason, you are wrong. Relax. This Let me just real, spell right? it out for you. This is real. <laughs> and that itself is huge. Like, mm. they're able to start new realities. Yeah, they're able to bring people back from the dead. That's super huge. That's they're big. They're affecting millions of people's lives at the drop of a hat. So oh, yeah. my interpretation of the doorman is... He runs the doorway to all these different realities. Mm. So there are countless universes or multiverses, if you will. (laughs) And they're all available to to enter through this one door. Hmm. Because like we only see the door, but we only see the door because that's the place where Michael is going. That's what I'm assuming. So the doorman literally like as soon as he stamps those papers and it proves that the door changes to wherever is needs to be going plus the doorman's the one who actually opens the door to earth so maybe like something in him opens that door to that reality whatever absolutely i think that's an interesting idea yeah i wonder if there's anything other than the door to earth though because if we're just thinking about like okay it's earth but it's different realities on earth that we're going to okay interesting but are there like doors to other places saturn maybe Are we going to go vacation on Saturn's (laughs) rings? Because that would be cool. Just saying. Maybe if there were people there Mm. or beings. You know, sometimes you just got to get away from everybody. Sure. And Saturn is the best destination. Anyway, We're getting off topic. I'm very intrigued by this hallway. Very intrigued by the doorman and his abilities. Like, he's the doorman, right? He's got to have some sort of abilities to have this job. There must be requirements for this. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping we'll see more of him, you know, and it's not just like one episode. We see him. It's a little joke about a frog mug. Yeah. Right. Well, do you want to talk frogs for a second? Sure. Let's talk frogs. Okay. So the frog is actually perfect for the doorkeeper. Why? Well, the frog as a spirit animal represents change and the transient nature of life. So the doorkeeper is literally in charge of the gateway to enact changes. Oh, that's cool. And in many traditions, frog represents the cleansing, renewal, rebirth, fertility, transformation, and ancient wisdom. Okay. So that's pretty cool. And this frog spirit comes to people who are not taking care of themselves Mm. in small scale like diet, exercise, or larger scales such as lifestyle. 
So like the tadpole changes and grows into something new. And so can you. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Always evolving. Right. And shamans also believe that frogs were a walker between worlds, water and earth. Mm. So in this case, earth and maybe the neutral zone or wherever they are right now. The judges chambers ish. Sure. I thought that was kind of neat. I don't know whether it was just a joke. Like the writer's like, you know what? I like frogs (laughs) and I'm reading way too much into it. But that's it kind of fits. That's pretty much the point of this podcast is we're reading way too much into it. Yes. But we like that. Yeah, we do like that. <laughs> and whoever's listening probably likes that too. I or hope else so. they'd stop listening. Um, I like that though. I didn't really think about the significance of the frog. Mm-hmm. It just reminded me of I think it was in a deleted scene in season one. It where, was the extended episode of the pilot. Yes. Where Michael starts talking about the almighty god frog, long may he reign. And <laughs> I just thought, oh, is this like some sort of like allusion to the like a uh, real god? Maybe Michael wasn't kidding. And He's just totally frog. pulling her leg. Like, I don't know. Yeah. And the doorman's just like, hey, I love having this picture of like the frog god. On right. My- it's like people having huh. a statue of Jesus in their car or like a bobblehead Jesus or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Okay. <laughs> Now, what do you think about that one-of-a-kind key from the very first Adams? So, to me, that sounds completely like urban legend bullshit. The very first Adams that came into existence in the universe being used to make a key for, like, this weird neutral zone doesn't make any sense to That's me. like saying like, that you on. have a car that was once owned by Elvis Presley or yeah, you know, something Yeah, it, like it sounds very, like... Oh, well, this crystal is made from blah, 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 from the waters of blah, 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 you know, and it is healing for whatever. (laughs) Like, it just doesn't sound real. I think it's a whole lot of crap. Okay. So, but I also feel like the doorman has completely bought into it. Like, it's a big joke, like, in in Michael or Sean's office is like, that guy totally thinks that key is, (laughs) is, like, ancient power. Yeah, exactly. It's like Michael's... Like, healing orbs that he's talking about sure, later, you yeah. know, with Tahani. Like, uh, they're really just spray-painted golf balls. But I tell <laughs> people that they're, you know, spiritual, so yeah. they buy it, right? It's just, to me, it's very silly that something so ancient and powerful and comes from the first Adams is just sitting there in his desk. Mm. In plain view, like, yeah. super conspic- inconspicuous, like... <laughs> Nobody's ever going to need to use this key for any reason whatsoever. Like, it's totally not Chekhov's gun situation. Oh, very good point. It probably will come into play at some point, most likely with the demons. So I wanted to ask you, getting back to our humans, which near-death experience do you think was actually closest to death? I believe Cheaties. Really? Oh, absolutely. Being crushed by an air conditioner? That's like a falling piano bit in the cartoons. That I don't think you can recover from that. That thing is not going to bounce off your head. I think it's going <laughs> to no, crush you. I'm not saying that Like all of these ways are actually how they died, right? Right. So we know that death was coming. But I guess I'm, I'm thinking of it more so in terms of like them seeing death coming. Like Eleanor... In that moment, she right, okay. saw... She saw it coming. She, yeah, she fell. She saw the the carts coming straight for her. Tahani could see that the statue was going to fall on her at the last second, which, dude, where did you think it was going to go? I know. Um, and then Jason, too, has that moment of, I can't breathe. I'm dying in here, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas Chidi was 100% unaware that he was going to die. Like, there's no way he thought, oh, yes, death is imminent. He just got crushed. That's Mm -hmm. it. Right. He wouldn't have had any... Right. Okay. I see what you're asking. So I feel like... Hmm. I feel like Chidi's is least near death-ish. So I'm surprised you said that one. Well, I misunderstood the question. Ah, yes. Well, I didn't explain the question very well. So (laughs) that might be why. (laughs) I don't know. Maybe Jason's in this situation. Like, you're Mm. trapped in this tiny enclosed space. Suddenly you can't breathe. You're terrified. You're panicking. You're Mm -hmm. freaking out. And poor Jason. That's a horrible way to die. No kidding. So I think Jason's the legitimate answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Like he probably felt like he was going to die. Yeah. Tahani did not. Otherwise she wouldn't be doing what she was doing. Mm -hmm. Eleanor probably didn't realize that she'd get hit by a truck after the carts hit her. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta say Jason's feels like the worst one to me. Suffocating? 
But part of the trauma is also realizing. Mm. So Eleanor definitely realized that she would have died. Maybe it's not just the realization that you are dying, but that you could have. And that is part of the terror. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because that's basically what contributes to all of their change, right? Mm -hmm. They all feel like, I could have died there. And if I had died, would I be happy with my life as it is currently? Right. So this whole this whole sequence of Michael saving everybody, I thought was going to be like half the episode. Oh, I'm so glad I thought that it, it was going to be like 20 minutes of him getting down <laughs> to Earth and seeing him trying to interact with either getting to the locations of saving them or I don't know, just something. But the whole thing is literally done in 40 seconds. And I should come to expect that my expectations are going to be completely thrown out the window (laughs) by this show. So I was very happy and very pleased with how it all unraveled in those 40 seconds and that I had no idea where the episode was going to go from there. I'm really, really glad that they didn't spend a whole lot of time on it because we want to get moving. As great as it is to see those moments, we don't really need to We know that they're going to get saved. So just breeze over them. Just get to it, you know? Get them back together as quickly as possible, which is what this episode does. Yep. Shall we continue? Janet and Michael watch as the four humans return to their old ways. Eleanor is selfish, Chidi is indecisive, Tahani is narcissistic, and Jason is impulsive. Michael and Janet know why they're not improving, so Michael decides to interfere once more. He uses the same travel papers granted by the judge to go back to Earth. He meets Eleanor in a bar and drops hints that lead her to Chidi. Oh, Michael! (laughs) <laughs> Michael, you're repeating the same mistakes you keep making over and over again. I know. He just can't stop himself from interfering, right? He just can't. It's not even that. It's that he keeps thinking that his ideas are perfect and mistakes happen. And he doesn't think about something and something else happens. And then he ends up rebooting 802 times. And then hmm. he's like, okay, well, I have to go get these people together. And then, oh, I got to go back again. Oh, I got to go back again. And he goes back multiple times because he's just Michael. But how could he have set this up where he would not have needed to interfere is my question. Like, all of them no, were in the, completely the, My point places. is he should have anticipated this from the start. Oh, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> but... I mean, how did you not see this coming, <laughs> exactly. Michael? Like, they're literally in different places all over the world and they don't know each other, how exactly are you expecting all of them to meet up and then become better? But, but, maybe Michael thought that just this near-death experience itself would be enough to propel them into being better people on their own. Right. But really, we see over and over again that they need each other, which is, like, part of Chidi's whole thing during his um, Scanlan speech, talking about, that we choose to do good because of our bonds with other people, right? And right. all of them are lonely. Mm-hmm. So they all need others to help them along this path. They can't do it alone. Mm-hmm. Which Michael should have obviously noticed, like, hello, all of them are lonely before. So yeah. anyway. Uh, your description of their old ways is much better than mine. <laughs> okay. I said Eleanor became a lazy jerk. Ah, yes. And Chidi was racked with indecision. Mm. Tahani goes back to being an obnoxious sophisticate. (laughs) And Jason, well, almost goes back, almost succeeds, but goes back to a life of really, really petty crime. I like your description better. Mine's just more (laughs) succinct, but yours is better. Now, this is months we're talking about. Oh, yeah. Did Janet and Michael just sit there watching their little strips of paper? I know. That's what I was wondering. I was thinking to myself, does time move the same way in the judge's chamber? Has the judge just been like sitting watching NCIS episodes for a year? Let's let's pause there for a second. I did some I crunched some numbers. Ooh, number crunching. I I like it. So it's it's neutral math. It's like hell math. Sure. Okay. If she's watching classic NCIS, okay, the original. (laughs) If she's watching three hours a day, do we know if it's the original? Because like, did she's probably watching all of them? Oh, good point. Yeah. So she's watching. If she's watching three hours a day, oh, she's watching more than that. Right, but let's talk sane people. (laughs) Three hours a day. (laughs) Three hours a day. No commercials. That's going to take eighty-eight days, just for the first 
show. That's okay. seven days a week. Okay. Now we're going to throw in NCIS Los Angeles. Ooh. And that's also no commercials, three hours a day, 73 days. Now we're down to NCIS New Orleans, mm. which is 24 days, which is a total of 185 days. That's like a school year. Yeah. Yeah. So she took weekends off. That's from almost NCIS. exactly <laughs> half a year of three hours a day, seven days a week, NCIS watching. Okay. That's insane. Yeah. 100%. But. <laughs> Okay, so, so I feel like we're getting some proof that time does move the same way. Yeah, if she's watching all of that for, you know, most of the day, then that is going to take her a couple months. Mm -hmm. And at this point in the episode where we find out that she's been binging these episodes, then it has been a few months at that point. It hasn't necessarily been... Has it been a year at that point? No. No, it hasn't. No, no. So, Okay. Yeah. I guess time is moving quite similarly. I mean, she could just be like ripping right through. No breaks, she might no not, nothing. Right. She might have them on speed, like times five speed. Yeah. Only enough time like off the episodes to just like, boom, there's some nachos. Boom, there's some homemade guac. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's it. Right. It's not like she's going to the bathroom. She's an eternal being. I don't think they have to pee. Right. Um, hmm. Okay. So getting back to our humans, I really, really like the montage. I think it's very well done. And I really like how much it feels like a New Year's resolution for all of them. Mm. You know, this whole oh, new year, new me kind of stuff where you just decide to change absolutely everything in your life. Cold turkey. Yep. Cold turkey. Chidi being, you know, decisive and cold turkey Eleanor trying to not be a trash bag from Arizona. Like, all of these things that are just not sustainable because you're changing way too much all at once. Mm -hmm. um, so I really like that. I thought it was very funny. And, and I, kind of depressing. Yeah. Oh, very relatable, though. And I thought that Tahani's montage part was the funniest. I loved it. I thought it was so good. Just like this super, super staged episode of what is basically like MTV Cribs was so good. And the jokes, that picture of her, that's like, it's so staged. I like, was a tomboy. Someone asks this question and you just happen to have a photograph of yourself standing in front of your old school wearing a sundress, a sun hat, and holding a basketball like it's a precious diamond. <laughs> what? Nuh-uh. Not happening. And then the really great joke... With the whole, like, Dalai Lama texted her this thing. It's very good. It's very, very good. Yeah. Yeah, it was very perfect. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to touch on a message that we got from Jan at JLMO on Twitter. She asked us, does Janet feel off to you guys? I just rewatched right before and I felt like she wasn't acting this human-like in the last episode. And this is where I started noticing Janet seem different. Mm -hmm. Agreed. She's... She's got this moment where she's listening to Michael realize that things are not going well and understanding why it's not working. And she's got this little like hair flick when she turns over to him and she looks annoyed. And I just can't. It's such a tiny little thing, but I can't remember her ever, ever playing with her hair or her clothes. Like she's always just perfectly put together and she doesn't ever have to adjust anything. And she also looks like genuinely frustrated that things are not working out as they'd hoped. And usually her facial expressions are kind of blank or like a default sort of cheery. And then she starts insisting that Michael doesn't break the rules. And that kind of feels different, right? She was always going along with all of Michael's plans, even when she wasn't acting so much as his assistant. Yeah, she would go along with him. She would bring up maybe something that's going to go wrong, but she would just have no problem with it she'd just go with it yeah and when she didn't go along with something she would always argue her point in this very emotionless way mm -hmm. like when she said that he needed to destroy her right. last season she just said hey you need to destroy me that's just the solution and she had almost no emotion about it she just right. logically this is the best solution there you go but here she actually seems like really emotionally invested very upset that he's not following the rules. And then she's arguing her point by saying stuff like, 
the judge is, you know, the judge of, you know, the universe. It's like sarcasm there. It's super sarcastic and really sassy. And it's so human. It just, it, I don't know. It was very strange. I don't know how I feel about it. Maybe I'm going to figure that out as we like talk through this episode, but I kind of didn't love it, which is weird because like, well, I it's love obviously Janet's done on purpose, journey. right? That's the point. It's, it's yeah. definitely on purpose. Oh, yeah. It's... I feel like it's just her, I don't know, trying to connect to human beings in a way that Michael does too. Like he tries to connect through like these fun mundane things and he's obviously very emotionally involved um with all four humans and then janet has this love for jason and an obvious affection for everyone else so she's kind of mimicking a lot of those human emotions maybe? so you don't think it's part of her evolution i think it is I feel like she she does start to mimic other human things, like we'll talk about later with the mommy and daddy thing, but I don't know. You're not buying it. It just, it feels off. It feels off, but maybe I'll buy it as I I watch more. Yeah, well, we can definitely pay attention to that as the episodes progress. Oh, we will. Janet Watch is, like, fully in effect. Right. It's always been in effect. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so getting back to something much less serious, when Michael says the whole, ah, well, don't even worry about it. She spends all her time in her chambers binging TV shows. Wow, I feel called out. (laughs) (laughs) I I think a lot of us do. I was like, oh, okay. Alrighty then. Are they watching me? (laughs) Like, is there a camera in here or what? (laughs) Do they see me rewatching this episode like way too many times? Okay. (laughs) Okay. And also another great relatable moment is when the doorman says, Ah, it's only 4.30. My shift doesn't end until 9 billion. Yeah, some days 100% feel like that. Love it. Ugh. (laughs) This episode's just really well written. Like, dialogue is very sharp, very funny. I thought Jen Statsky and Michael sure did a really great job. Mm -hmm. And all the other writers, I'm sure, were pitching ideas, I thought. Everyone was... On their A-game. So, very happy. Let's continue. Eleanor tells Chidi about her near-death experience and her brief time as a better person. She tells him about seeing his lecture, and she asks Chidi to help her become a better person. Chidi agrees without hesitation. And how did you feel about the explanation of the accent? Did you feel like it was kind of shoehorned in, or did you buy it? or It was very shoehorned in, I thought. Uh, did not love it. Chidi's French, no offense, dude, not great. Um, <laughs> like the accent, not great. I actually could not understand what he was saying. And then I <laughs> knew that the other person was speaking French. So I was like, oh, he must be responding in French. And then I had to watch it a couple times to like understand what he was saying. But you know what? That's fine. People Accents online. Are super tricky. Ugh. So, and... I know that we brought it up a couple times, but I also know that people online were really harping on it. And so it just kind of feels like, hey, we put this in so that people will stop bothering us about it, which I don't love. I do like, however, that they added that he also speaks German and Greek and Latin because, of course, Chidi is going to be indecisive when Mm -hmm. it comes to learning languages. So at least they added that little bit that felt less... Yeah, it made it sound yeah. more believable. Yeah. And Eleanor pronouncing GIF wrong? Uh, yes, terrible. Haha, ha, it's a great joke. I'm hoping that people aren't going to be like pointing that out for forever because it's just not going to be very funny. Mm-hmm. Like it's not funny now anymore, I don't think. It was funny when I was watching the episode, but now it's like, ha ha, well, if her pronunciation of gif or gif whatever it must be the bad place yeah exactly it's eh, yeah okay thank you we've had that joke like ten thousand times so yeah (laughs) that's how i feel about that that's fair (laughs) so i want to talk about this little moment here and ask you how believable do you think this is chidi says to eleanor you flew all the way from arizona to see me it's kind of a good point like do you really think that Eleanor would do something that big? Old Eleanor? No. 
I don't know. It's it's it is a huge thing to do, but all these events leading up to her decision, I could buy it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It does feel big. It's she it's wants a to change her life. I think she wants to change her life. She wants to make this huge. I think part of her thinks that in order to change your life, you have to make these gigantic decisions, mm-hmm. like going to Australia suddenly instead of just waking up and changing your life from within. Yeah, no, that's a good point. A lot of people feel like they uh, have to change your life by doing something dramatic, like quitting their job and finding something different. Going or to travel the cities. world. Or... Yeah, exactly. So, okay, I-, I can sort of see it. I guess I thought for some reason that maybe she would just be visiting Australia. But clearly we see that she's moved there. Like she's, she's, you know, later on we find out that she's just staying in a hotel, but she's been there for months and she's going to take part in a study that's going to last anywhere from three to six months. Yeah. So that's a commitment. You're not just staying there for a couple of weeks and asking, hey, Chi, can you help me via Skype session? Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> you are committed. You are staying there. Don't know what the heck Eleanor is doing for work. And I hope we explore it at some point or at least mention it. You know, I I don't want it to be like, oh, Eleanor is just magically living here on what money does she have? Good thing she got inheritance from Uncle Jack. Yeah, yeah. Something dumb like that. Just give her some sort of random job. Sure. You know, she could be working uh, at We Crumb from a Land Down Under, you know, which I thought was a great joke. Yeah. Yeah. Super Megan Amram style. Apparently it wasn't her, though. I've been listening to the good place the podcast which by the way if uh anyone is listening to this podcast and they haven't listened to that it's really good um mark evan jackson is great as a host and it's really very fun it's a very different podcast than this one but it is really fun if you like to know about behind the scenes stuff but anyway their episode on this episode um they mentioned that it wasn't megan amram it was someone else in the writer's room. Megan would be so proud. I feel like, yeah, maybe proud, a little jealous, maybe. Maybe. Mm, yeah. So, Eleanor's money situation. Hopefully, mm-hmm. they talk about that. Yep. And I do like how Eleanor does call herself out. She's mm-hmm. like, you know mm-hmm. what? That's something that I would have said. Yeah. I would have got super defensive, but I can be open and be honest, and I don't have to have my de- defenses up. Yeah. I guess, yeah, I can believe that she flew to Australia because she gets that she can't do this by herself, right? And that's exactly what Eleanor was doing, right? She was hanging around the same crummy trash bag people. Even though she was in a different job, she was still struggling kind of all alone. Like, she didn't have a close friend she could confide to. And... Chidi's message wasn't just about, oh, well, you need to be a better person because you're a trash bag and I'm better than you and you should watch by example. It was, it was all about not being alone in this world. And although Eleanor likes to pretend that she's totally fine being on her own, all lone wolf style, I think she's a really lonely person and she knows that she needs help. Like, it's a tough thing to admit your flaws and to go and try and find help and actually try to be better in whatever you're not great at. Mm-hmm. So I like that. I like that we see that Eleanor has grown over this past year, even if she did slide back. We see that she slid back, but she's aware of that. And that's good. Because clearly when we do see Tahani, when we do see Jason, like a lot of them don't really get it, you know? And I feel like Eleanor is the most progressed of all of them. Hmm. Which probably goes with her just being our most main-ish character, other than Michael. Right. So, I'm really good at talking. Most main-ish character. (laughs) 100%. I talk for a living. It's all good. Whatever. Hey. Yeah. So, okay. I had a little, I had a very little, like, shipper moment in this part because when Eleanor says, I need someone to help guide me, morally speaking... And I think I need it to be you. It kind of reminded me of this line that I've heard when people are trying to explain what namaste means. And it starts off with like, there's different interpretations, but it starts off with my soul recognizes your soul. And it was just this very sweet moment of like, 
they obviously don't have those memories of before, but there's something that she feels like tethered to him in some way, right? Mm -hmm. And it was just very romantic, (laughs) I thought. Hmm. Uh, And then my dreams got crushed later, but that's fine. Um, Yeah, so I thought it was very sweet. I really liked it. And there was just something about their connection that she could really see, and that made me happy. Yeah, and I think it also helped the way it was framed in the show. Mm. Like, the the director of photography was did a good job of, of putting the two of them in that situation mm-hmm. on screen. I think so, too. I still did have a brief moment of panic before Chidi said yes, though. I think when mm-hmm. we were watching it, oh, yeah. <laughs> I grabbed your arm and I was like, oh, my God, what if he says no? <laughs> Never fear. Chidi is Sexy here. book. Library, <laughs> sexy librarian <laughs> guides him the right way. Oh goodness! All right, so let's hear about Chidi's experience. Chidi tells Eleanor about his near-death experience and his year of self-improvement. Chidi thinks nearly being crushed by an air conditioning unit is a sign that he should stop using air conditioners because of the freon, and it's bad for the environment. When Uzo tells him his brain is broken. Chidi meets with Dr. Simone Garnett to see if his indecision is caused by his brain. Turns out, Chidi's brain is healthy and great looking. Uh, yeah. And he, rea- and he realizes that he simply needs to decide to be more decisive. Life is going swimmingly until he gives advice to his friend Henry, which inadvertently causes Henry severe injuries. Chidi returns to his old wishy-washy ways. Great alliteration. Oh yeah, thanks. Okay, so I like that Chidi's path goes in a different way. He doesn't immediately think, oh, no, I've been living my life so horribly. I'm super indecisive and, you know, I've just got to buck up and deal with it. He immediately thinks he's got a brain problem. Mm -hmm. Like, (laughs) Must be a medical issue. Yeah, must be, must be, because it can't just be a psychological thing. It can't just be extreme anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Someone should see a therapist. Anyway, (laughs) I do feel like it would be a little out of character, though, for him to go see a therapist because then he'd have to find a therapist and choose one and making that decision would be really hard. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he goes to the biology department. Yeah. And I'm going to stop right there and we're going to talk about the the board of names. Oh, yeah. Because yes, yes. they are my favorite <laughs> thing of the episode. Absolutely my favorite part of this episode. I don't care what anybody says. The names on the board feel to me like how a non-native English speaker would think English names are pronounced or that they are. We have Pamela Watermelon. Dr. Pamela Watermelon. Yeah, I'm just... Pamela worked hard for that doctorate. You're going to call her that. I'm not going to say doctor <laughs> for every one of these names. And then we have Poston Bridgehampton. Poston. Poston with two W's. <laughs> Nerlens Mrelk. <laughs> that one's just like they slammed the keyboard and that's what came out. Nerlens Mrelk. M R E L K. And then we have Ginger Catapulp. <laughs> I was like, um, we're really close to Catapult. We've got another Ginger. Ginger Letitia Shroomf. <laughs> um, Pat Sajak, can I buy a vowel, please? <laughs> Shroomf. <laughs> okay, I have to say, my favorite is Dr. Fran Van Planaram. <laughs> and I feel like that's... Megan Amram. Yeah, it's gotta be, right? Um, mine was Fran Van Planaram and the Space Jam Whammer Band. <laughs> that's that's what I imagine their band would be called. Ooh, yeah. I like it. I yeah. like it. Should jam with with Fran. Yeah, and her Van Planaram. <laughs> oh, so those are those are some pretty great names. Yeah, yeah. Oh goodness. So should we talk about Simone? Sure. I like her. Yeah, me too. She's fun. She's upbeat. She's kind of quirky. I feel like a lot of people are going to assume that I don't like her because she's getting in the way of Chidi and Eleanor. I don't. I don't dislike her at all. I think she's really fun. She's very enthusiastic and she's adorable. Like her reaction to Chidi coming in and she says this whole spiel about 
Oh, well, you just come into my office and you expect to go into the MRI machine? Ridiculous. The $3 million MRI machine? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the guy in the $5,000 suit. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I just love that she's like, I love it. You're so weird. Let's go. Like, she's... I like it. I think it's great. She's totally game for whatever crazy thing Chidi has to say. And I, I, I just like her. She radiates this enthusiasm and she's very charming, mm-hmm. I thought. Now, I know the accent's not perfect, um, but honestly, I didn't really notice that on the first watch. I only kind of started noticing it a little bit after that, but it's not enough to bother me. And that's most likely because I'm not Australian and I don't know anyone from Australia, so I never hear the accent and therefore can't really criticize it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's tough when... You don't hear an Australian in your regular day-to-day activities and all your influences from what you learn about Australians are, you know, pop culture and TV shows and hearing them, you know, whatever. So I don't mind it either. Yeah. It could be the worst Australian accent you've ever heard, but I don't feel like it is. It 100% is not because Ted Danson does one. There you go. And I didn't realize until like halfway through his conversation that he was trying to do an accent. I just thought he was talking normally. (laughs) It was pretty bad. Yeah, it was real bad. Um, But anyway, um, a lot of people online, I was looking at people's reaction to Simone is not great. Yeah. They really don't like her, don't like her accent. And a lot of people feel like she's planted by Sean. Mm. Uh, she's a demon. She's in fact Vicky. Oh my gosh! So oh come on, Vicky's accent was worse. <laughs> I know but that was another thing that you know a nail in the mm-hmm. coffin because Vicky has perfected her Australian accent right, from yeah. season two, episode one. Right. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I think it's just a, a bunch of people throwing out their theories right, and hoping right. one of them sticks, mm-hmm. which is fair. Go for it. I'm all for theories, but I just personally do not share that theory. No, I don't either. I I did really love her joke about that like horrifying surgery. And then she says, and the great part is that you're awake the whole time. And she has this huge smile on her face. And I was like, yes, make him feel nervous. I love it. <laughs> so, that's, that's probably like, like neuroscience humor. Oh, it's yeah. like Chidi's got his philosophy humor and each department has their own dumb jokes. Yeah. So then, once Chidi realizes it's not his brain, and he has the data to prove it, he just decides to be more decisive? I I don't know. Does that seem kind of out of character to you? Or do you feel like it's earned? It's interesting, because once he's lived his life with all these theories and concepts and philosophies, nothing is tangible or set in stone. There's all It's, it's all wishy-washy. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly he's seeing solid science that can explain things and maybe he's realizing that you can just do something you can just you don't have to keep going over all these ideas and possibilities and you can just have a solid answer so his first step is to just wake up in the morning and do it okay i think it would have been nice to see maybe a a small montage of him progressively getting more decisive Hmm, but i i I buy it yeah okay i mean near-death experience and everything right change your life immediately right it's very interesting that he doesn't go for psychology he doesn't think that has anything to do with like anxiety or any kind of mental illness he immediately assumes like it's physical it's something physically wrong with his brain Mm mm-hmm And it's kind of funny that Simone doesn't suggest maybe you should see a therapist. Maybe you should see a psychiatrist or something. But, you know, that's fine, right? He sees empirical evidence and he decides, okay, let's just, let's go with that. You know, I'll Mm -hmm. just, I'll accept it as it is. It's not my brain. I can't use that as an excuse. I just need to make these decisions. I need to decide to be decisive. Yeah. So. I feel like it's a little rushed, a little tiny bit, you know, we could have used a little bit more, but we've only got 44 good. minutes in the uh, the episode. So. Yeah, I know. And we got to get stuff done, right? Yeah. 
We have to have them all together by the end of the episode. So one thing I noticed in this part, and I thought was really interesting, I feel like it's going to be relevant in later episodes. Simone mentions Chidi's hippocampus, and then she says that that's the part that regulates memory. And she says that this looks great. It looks very strong. So I wonder if this is going to be a hint for the future, because in that same montage, on Chidi's whiteboard, he has Parfit and Locke on personal identity and Locke's memory theory. I just feel like these are hints. These are hints that something, something's going to happen. They're going to maybe, I don't know, I don't know, maybe remember what happened. Maybe Simone will poke a part of the brain and trigger a flash of memories. I don't know. I'm just so intrigued. Are they going to do something about it? You know? Ooh, I like that. I feel like they're dropping hints. I really do. So I kind of want to go into like a tiny little, might not be so tiny, TD's chalkboard moment. Will you come along with me? Let's do it. Let's okay. dive in. So, back to Chidi's, uh, Chidi's whiteboard. Um, so, he's talking about personal identity, which we have talked about before on this podcast. What is personal identity? What's the nature of it? Is it consistent over time? And some of the answers to this are, well, we're the same person over time as long as we have the same soul. Um, or we're the same person over time as long as we have the same body, or we're the same person over time as long as we have the same consciousness. So we've discussed before Hume's bundle theory of the self. We talked about it in season one and two, and his view that persons are nothing but a bundle of collection of different impressions that are in a perpetual state of change. So imagining that there's like a box with your name marked on it, and in that box is just all the, it's a collection of things that make you who you are, your relationship to other people, your political views, your opinions, your job, all that kind of stuff, right? But here we have two different people who kind of talk about consciousness as a way to measure personal identity over time. So Locke argued that it was sameness of consciousness. So if present Chidi can remember past Chidi's thoughts and actions, then past Chidi is the same person as present Chidi. We already know that that's not true. He can't remember his past. Unless, of course, we don't think of the afterlife as his past. Like, linearly, it is. But in this reality, it's not. Even so, he's not the same person that he was in the afterlife, according to Locke. None of the humans would be the same persons because they don't have these memory connections, right? So basically what that says is that Chidi is not the same person simply because he doesn't have the memories from the their time in the bad place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because he doesn't, these memory connections don't exist, right? If you don't remember you know, what you were doing a year ago, all these kind of things, then you're not that same person. Right. So, for example, if you were to put Chidi beside Chidi, one of them has memories from the bad place and all these reboots. Yeah. And beside current Chidi, who survived the air conditioning mishap, Mm -hmm. those are very different people. Yeah. They're still both named Chidi. They look the same. Well, yeah, I totally agree. We were shaped by our experiences. Exactly. But according to Locke, they are not the same person because they don't share the same consciousness. They don't share the same memory memory connections, right? They don't have the same memories. Mm -hmm. So they are essentially different people. Right. And Parfit, he kind of explains it similarly to Hume. He states that there's no personal identity over time. So there's no singular you from birth to death. Like there's no unchanging person. But he believes that we have this psychological connectedness with ourselves, and that's what matters most. That we have this connectedness of memory and character and continuity. So his idea is that if you have enough parts of you that survive this passage of time, like enough memories, enough character traits, uh, that you're essentially going to be the same person, right? 
little things will change, but not in this complete entire way, right? That again speaks to the fact that none of these characters are the same people that we saw in season one, mm-hmm. are the same people that were in Rude Boot 523, or are the same people that we saw in most of season two. They're all essentially different because they don't share memory connections and they don't share this psychological connectedness. They don't have this continuity, this memory. They don't even have exactly the same character traits. Like, similar, for sure, but we saw, you know, different parts of them. We saw them grow in season two in ways that they haven't grown yet in season three. So, I think it's interesting, anyway, that we have on Chidi's whiteboard two people that really touch on memory as being the touchstone for personal identity because I really think it's going to be relevant this season. I feel like these are hints and I'm just excited. I'm excited at the possibility that they could remember because that's been part of my issue with this show. Like I love this show, obviously. I wouldn't podcast about it if I didn't, but it's just sad to get to know and love characters and then have them kind of disappear. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of the growth that we had in season one, it's gone, right? The Eleanor that we know now has never said to Chidi, you are my flashlight. I was in a cave in the dark. Like we, the Jason and the Janet that we know now never actually had those moments of getting married and having the rip off sleeves and the whole like send nude pics of your heart to me. They don't have those memories. They didn't happen to them. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of excited. I I think there's some really interesting things that might happen this season. So I completely agree. And it it's very unique in that sense that mm. the characters that we grow to love have disappeared. Yeah. They're gone, but replaced with similar but different. So yeah, I'm definitely interested in seeing where they take us yeah. with the memory passage. And I, I really hope you're right. And I kind of wonder like part of this whole personal identity it really does apply to michael and janet too right but in a very different way because they haven't had their memories wiped so michael is essentially true but janet does retain a little bit of that right because she says like they learn and adapt and change every time they are rebooted so Mm -hmm. it's like she doesn't have the memories exactly but even in season two we saw that she was affected by things that she didn't even remember happening. Right. Yes. The whole Jason thing, right? Absolutely. And her glitches. So Janet is, you know, in a category of her own, which she's always been. But Michael, Michael is the most himself out of anybody on this mm-hmm. show, I think. But Michael, I guess, according to Parfit, because he talks about this psychological connectedness being partly made out of character michael's character has completely changed right Mm -hmm. but if you're thinking of this psychological connectedness as like chain mail which is how by the way hank green explains it in an episode of crash course which will be linked in the show notes it's like these little pieces like these little pieces of chain mail all connected and his are going off on a different kind of line and the ones sort of at the beginning they're fading right so like his his character, I guess, where he was evil and he was manipulative and he just wanted to torture humans, those are starting to fade. And he's going in a different direction hmm. now. Where he's not completely good person with a capital G and P, but he's well intentioned, I guess. So sure, yeah. and he cares. Yeah. God, I love this show. <laughs> I love this show. It's just like I So thick. Yeah, there's so much there. And it's a comedy show on at like 8, 7 Central on NBC. Like it's just, it kind of boggles the mind that we're talking about Locke and Parfit and personal identity in a show that's just supposed to be like, ah, look, feel good type of show. I I don't know. I I miss this show. It's lighthearted humor on the top and thick and juicy contents in the middle. Mm, thick and juicy just yeah that's how i want to describe the good place from now on (laughs) 
Okay. Did you have anything to say about that? <laughs> that word vomit I just uh, threw up all over you? No, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Okay. So do you feel like Simone is Chidi's guide? Because I sort of feel like she is in a way. Guide? Yeah, I feel like she's prompted him to be more decisive um, because her nature is just like that. You know, she makes decisions very quickly. Um, even when Chidi said, oh, hey, I want to use the MRI machine. She said, all right, let's go. Like right now. Let's do it. You don't think it's because maybe she's got a little crush on him and he's got a little crush on her. And... Oh, I'm certain that plays into that for sure. So I feel in a way like she's kind of his guide hmm. in, in a different way. Not so much morally speaking, but maybe just, hey, make a decision. Be more decisive. Live your life in a more enjoyable way. Don't so be so miserable. She's cheaty and he's Eleanor. Yeah, a little bit in this scenario. Yeah, a little bit. So let's talk quickly about soulmates. Ooh, okay. In this episode, in this reality, mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that Chidi is not really that interested in Eleanor, and Eleanor doesn't really look at Chidi like that. I mean, they've only known each other for a few weeks. Yeah. But if we look back to season two, mm -hmm. when they were going through all the reboots, there were many that Chidi and Eleanor were not soulmates. And mm -hmm. Janet even references that this episode. Yep. So maybe Eleanor has a new soulmate, this reality. And maybe Chidi does as well. I feel like they're just not doing soulmates. Like soulmates is a very afterlife kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? Well, it, it's not an afterlife thing. It's no, it's an no, earthly that's thing. That's true. That you just happen to be hooked up with your soulmate in the afterlife if you never ran into them on Earth. Yeah. You and I have been into enough weddings to hear people say i just married my soulmate blah 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 so here i am sounding very um <laughs> unenthusiastic <laughs> about love but <laughs> pessimistic maybe uh i just feel like they're not really going that in that direction i don't think that chidi and eleanor are soulmates you know how i feel about soulmates i think it's cheesy right okay but i do like that it kind of just it goes to show that Eleanor and Chidi don't need to be romantically involved to help each other and yes. to care about each other and to want to spend time together. Yeah. And Eleanor is a great wingman. Wingwoman. Yeah, she is. 100%. I'm really, really glad that she's not jealous. We're not doing that. And I really hope that we don't go and do that. I don't. We don't need to. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to hate it. I'm going to hate it if they do that. As much as you love them together. Oh, yeah. No, I just, I don't want... I don't want it to be this whole, oh, we're going to like fight over Chidi and like now I don't like you because you're a threat to my love interest, whatever. Nah, I don't want to do that. We have enough women fighting over men on TV and in movies. I just, nah, garbage. I don't want it. Yeah, that was one other so. thing that I noticed when Chidi introduced Eleanor to Simone. Like there was, it was just, hey, this is this woman Eleanor and this is Simone. Like there was no like... Oh, who's she? Or like... Yeah. Ugh, I'm prettier than her. There was none of that. No. It was just... It was immediately... Eleanor's like, hey, she's got the hots for you. You got the hots for you. Oh, my God. This is perfect. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, let's... We're getting... We're off track. Yes. Let's get back to the library. Okay. We're back in the library. Chidi's got his card of books. Uh, okay. Very visibly mm -hmm. on top is The Man Who Laughs by Victor Hugo, who we know is in the bad place being tortured. Oh, wow. I didn't even... Pick that up. Nice. Yep. Okay. And Michael says he's kind of a, a little bit of a baby about being tortured. Yeah. 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 Oh, sacre bleu. I peed in my pants. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So Michael's accent, we've already mentioned that it's horrible. Um, God awful. Yeah. I love that yeah. he, he thinks he nailed it. And Janet's like, oh, yeah. Flawless. Yeah. Flawless. <laughs> and Chidi holds up Tezande's book, Chocolate Book. Thinking oh, maybe the answer's in here. And Who knows? Of course, Tezande of the Chocolate Rain fame. Uh, he never wrote a book called Chocolate Book. I did look look it up because okay. I was interested, and I was looking through Tezande's website and going through some of his uh, his reels of acting and voice mm -hmm. acting, and mm -hmm. he does audiobooks and yeah, he's got. I mean, we all know he's got a gorgeous voice. Mm, yes. 
So <laughs> I thought. I I really love Chidi's just his panic state asking, do I need more books? Is the secret books? And how many books can I take out? Is it 12,000? Yeah, that's that's absolutely Chidi. Chidi has always looked for answers in books. He doesn't ever think to really look anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Back to the the office where Eleanor says that she imagined it was a sexy librarian. And like, if you don't do that, like, why don't you do that? You can do it for free. Oh, I love that line. That's a great line. line. Yes. That's That's such a Mindy line, too. I feel like Mindy would describe masturbation that way. Oh. You don't do that? You can do it for free. Like, you should be doing it all the time. Uh, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to bring up a user on Reddit in the oh. Good Place subreddit. JWTBF says, Podcasts. Never go look up what your podcast hosts look like. It's always disappointing. Even if they have crazy sounding voices, I imagine them as being super handsome or super hot or super sexy. Then I see them and they look like trolls. Absolute (laughs) trolls. So I thought that was great. So, hey, what up from a couple of trolls in Canada? (laughs) And then he edits his comment and says, oh, the exception is the Good Place podcast. So I'm assuming he's talking about ours. Oh, yeah, obviously, because we're super not trollish and not trollish. (laughs) Um, We have our picture on our website, by the way. Yeah, I'm regretting that now. (laughs) Um, Anyway. Okay, so at this point... We need to zoom through the episode. I know, I know, I know. But we see Sean. Sean is still in the episode. Meanwhile... So that was was a great transition because Michael says, now we can relax. Everything is finally on track. Yeah. Cut to... Dun, dun, dun! Exactly. Cut to the villain being like, oh, what's going on? I'm here to make sure everything is not on track. Yeah. Yeah. So Sean and his crew are, Sean and his crew are hacking away, trying to break into Jen's system. And so Sean knows that there's a plan going on. Yeah. How does he know is my question. We don't know. Because he didn't get into the judge's office, right? So how does he know that the humans are back on Earth at all? Mm-hmm. I'm, that's the part that I'm a little bit confused about. Like, okay, sure, he's trying to hack into the judge's system, but I feel like we missed the part where he actually finds out that they're on Earth. Yes. So we're going to learn. Because the portal was still closed at that point. Yeah. So what's, uh, what's happening here? Does he have moles on Earth? Somebody Hmm. telling him what's going on. Oh, man. This is going with the whole Simone is... Is Vicky theory. I don't like it. I know. I don't but, like it one bit. Well, I feel like we're going to find out pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And it might just be Trevor. Yeah. It, I, yeah. it could just <laughs> could just be Trevor. Yeah, That's that yeah. simple. Maybe he's the only mole and he came somehow after. And so I still don't know how he knows they're on Earth. But maybe Michael's we'll super that. predictable. And Sean's probably like, you know oh, what? Yeah. He's probably going to try and reset everything. So let's <laughs> throw somebody on Earth. <laughs> he already reset things 802 times. Yep. Why wouldn't he do it again? Exactly. So the funny thing is that when we were watching this for the first time, I knew Mark Evan Jackson was still on the show. Like I knew because I was listening to the good place, the podcast, and he had been talking about, you know, filming for season three. And yet when he showed up on screen, I was like, Sean, Sean's still in the show. That's great. I'm excited. So I'm just an idiot. And that's funny. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, it, it really just caught me by surprise. Um, and as much as the cocooning thing, like it was, it was cute, I guess. I feel like they did that joke a little too much. I did love when he suggests they play something terrible and they chose Right Here Waiting by Richard Marks, which is just, ugh, yeah, okay, good choice. Mm-hmm. But I feel like I could come up with a better one. And that is Aerosmith's I Don't Want to Miss a Thing. Oh, it's so bad. So bad. So bad. That is my Bad Place song. Oof. Yeah. 100%. I'm in the Bad Place whenever that song comes on at a wedding and I'm working the wedding. And I have to stay in the room. Oh, that's a bad song. Mm. And it's so don't want to miss a thing. Ugh, cue the vomiting. My question to you is what is your truly terrible song that inspires you you know what it is but i can't think of the name it's 
It's like it's the song that's like all of me. Yeah, that's all that's of so you. bad. Oh my god, I hate that song all so much. All your curves and all your edges, all, all your, your perfect, perfect imperfections. Yeah. Oh my god, it's so oh, it's gross. It makes me want to. That's that's, fine. that's the one. It's <laughs> awful. It's so bad. I want to barf every time I hear it. It's just like internal cringe every time. Jason, we sound like enemies of romance. <laughs> we do. We do. Because these songs are so bad. We're like ugh. Soulmates, ugh, Aerosmith, ugh, cheesy love song, you know? (laughs) I guess we're just not all about that life. Sorry, guys. After a lesson, Eleanor and Chidi bump into Simone. Eleanor spies that Simone likes our favorite moral philosopher and schemes to set them up. In a scene straight out of a rom-com, Eleanor helps Chidi ask out Simone while he's lying in an MRI machine. Michael panics that he's left too much to chance and he decides to go back to Earth Again. So a small note, I really like Eleanor's shirt in this scene. (laughs) I know, it's like the tiniest possible note. I like it. It's a button-up jean shirt. It's got embroidered stuff, but it's like, it's got mountains that remind me very much of Arizona. I just also like seeing Eleanor in her own clothes. We've spent two seasons with her wearing fake Eleanor's clothes, so it's nice to see her be herself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great way to put this scene. Mm Mm-hmm. Straight out of a rom-com. Oh, 100%. Yeah, it's nice. I love it. And of course, Michael's reaction is, well, this is horrible. This is a disaster. Everything's going wrong. Yeah. And Eleanor, Chidi, and Simone are all buddy-buddy. Yeah. I really like that Eleanor and Chidi feel like real friends in this reality. There's less of this power imbalance that we've had the last couple of seasons where he's the teacher and she's the student and he's this savior of her right because mm-hmm. he's trying to save her from an eternity of damnation right and now you just have her helping him he's confiding to her about his life and his struggles with decision making and his struggles with romance and i like that you know when she talks to him later on and says well you didn't kiss her because you're chickened out and he turns around and goes i did i was like oh that's so genuine just instead that, of that... like hey that's you know why would you say that that's rude i didn't chicken out i just wasn't the right time it, yeah it was just like i did oh my goodness i totally did that's yeah. just how friends talk to each other they're vulnerable together mm-hmm. and i like it i really do mm-hmm. well chidi's in eleanor's field right now like eleanor mm-hmm. knows a thing about romance oh, maybe she not she may not be great at it herself but she can see it yes I just feel like Michael's reaction is like all Eleanor and Chidi shippers like, oh, this is a disaster. They're dating now and now Eleanor and Chidi are together. And I had a brief moment of that. <laughs> um, I had a brief moment of maybe Eleanor can get with somebody else this season. Like, uh, like a certain, certain uh, tall British giraffe. Socialite. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Ooh, maybe it'll actually happen. Maybe. I don't want to get my hopes too I know, right? up. But... Uh, so what do we think about Janet calling uh, the judge mommy and trying out dad for Michael? I'm with her and saying no, 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 mm, very much mm-hmm. no. Yeah, no. As soon as it happened, I kind of just wanted it scrubbed from my memory. Very like eternal sunshine of the spotless mind style. Like just just get it out. Just, Never it's happened. Weird. I don't I don't want to see it again. Yep. And then I watched it many times. But I do think it's interesting. She's relating to human beings. Um, She's experimenting. She's trying new things. Yeah. Every human being has parents. And, you know, last season she made herself a rebound boyfriend. But now she's finding authority figures around her to try and test out as parents. And I feel like that's a very human thing to do, too, because a lot of people have called their teachers mom or dad at some point. Or they have felt some sort of, like motherly affection or fatherly affection towards someone older or maybe you know someone younger sort of as a parent so it's interesting it kind of reminds me too of the moment where jason called michael janet's dad in season one she's like (laughs) and your dad is like this cool all-powerful guy and she's like "Eh, not my dad so yeah maybe there's a little bit of uh jason rubbing off on her there (laughs) Michael's return inadvertently helps Sean hack into the judge's system and allows him to see everything happening with the four humans. While Eleanor talks to Chidi about his relationship with Simone, she sparks an idea in Chidi, 
They rush to Simone's office and Chidi explains that his thesis will explore the effect of near-death experience. Chidi explains that his thesis will explore the effect of near-death experiences on ethical decision making. Interesting thesis idea. It's great. Hmm. I like it. Yeah. It's very believable. Like it sounds like a legit scientific study. Yeah. I think it's really interesting and I'm really interested to see how it pans out. Yes. Yeah. So um I want to talk about the bulletin board mm. that he pins up his note on. Okay. Because I thought it was great. I always like looking at background stuff, other oh, yeah. things that are on boards. Oh, yeah. The, so, uh, yeah. The people like, working on this show are so creative. They come up with so many great things that I feel like it's a crime not to pause and check it out. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure a lot of them are scouring the net being like, oh, I wonder if anybody noticed this that mm-hmm. I did or... Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, on the post that Chidi pins his study on, there's a poster for an LGBTIQ movie night, which includes uh, Muriel's Wedding, mm-hmm. Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, and Mad Max 2 with, with Tina, Tina Turner. Turner. So all four, all three of those movies are Australian movies, mm-hmm. and two of them actually happen to be made in 94. I also noticed a couple different flyers on that bulletin board. Um, there's a flyer for Blueberry Muffins. Which I thought was great. Yep. Since uh, blueberries are basically Chidi's new almond milk. Yep. And another flyer that says, vote Sackett. Every criminal deserves a third chance. <laughs> Which I was <laughs> like, correct. um, is that sarcastic? Like a don't vote for him? Or like, is that really his tagline? Because I just, I have a lot of thoughts about this whole near death experience thing and how it could affect ethical decision making. But I feel like I'm going to leave those thoughts for later. Um, yeah, the, we can talk about that as the season as progresses. The season progresses. Yeah, for sure. And as we see the study happen, right? Mm-hmm. So moving right along, that brings us to Tahani arrives in Australia as a new member of the Ethical Neuroscientific Study. She recounts the last year, explaining that after her near-death experience, she decided to leave the spotlight to seek enlightenment. While living in a monastery, she's offered a chance to return to the spotlight, and she pounces on it. Now a best-selling author of a self-help book titled get out of the spotlight, Tahani is back to her old ways. At a book event, Michael points out that Tahani's book is completely inauthentic, and furious, she agrees to participate in Chidi's study to prove that she's a good person who helps others. Again, it seems like she's doing it for the wrong reasons. 100%. <laughs> but um, it's, it's so interesting that she went to a monastery and to live with the monks. Yeah. I mean, it's really on the nose, and everybody obviously noticed that, but... Oh, yeah. She went hard, eat, pray, love on this. Like, yeah, I'm just like Jianyu. I'm going to like give up all attachments. Mm, yeah, it kind of bothers me because doing that is a really privileged thing to do. Like being able to do that, being able to do that, being able to just shirk all of your responsibilities because you're incredibly wealthy. Yeah, not everybody can do that. So I feel like she's. She looks at herself and thinks of herself as, like, a better person now because she's done all of that. But, like, there are plenty of celebrities out there who are in the spotlight and are still doing good things. And they're not doing it to get praise and acclaim. They're doing it because they're trying to use their position of power, I suppose, um, to do good things in the world. Like, Mm -hmm. If you listen to some of the actors on this show, like Jamila Jamil herself is actually like out there talking about important issues and it just, it it bugged me. It just kind of bothered me because it was like, oh, well, this is the only thing you can do. And like anyone who's in the spotlight, you know, is clearly not a very good person. And look at me, I'm, I can somehow manage to do this because I don't have to pay rent and work for a living. Like it, anyway. That was just some slight um, frustration on my side because it's a very privileged thing to be able to do. Mm -hmm. For sure, Eleanor would not have been able to do that. Jason would not have been able to do that because they're not wealthy. So, yeah, that's just me ranting. (laughs) (laughs) So the squalor news that comes to interview her while she's in the monastery, very obviously Vice. Yeah. The logo is pretty much the exact same, Mm -hmm. typeface, outlines, etc. I do love the reveal of her book. You know, you've got her just talking about, oh, well, I didn't want to do that. I didn't come out here to be in the spotlight again. Boom, look at me. And she's on a book tour. The transition was absolutely amazing. Yeah. 
And the the book cover, the posters all over her uh, pied de terre in <laughs> Barcelona, whatever. It's Barcelona. It's, it's just so insincere. It comes off as so staged, and it's perfect. I also like Michael's approach with Tahani because it's very different from everybody else. He's mean. He calls her out on all the crap that she's spouting. Oh, he's mean. Like, he's really harsh. Just saying, oh, I know you're tricking everybody. I know this is just you trying to get fame. I love your scam. Money. <laughs> you're just scamming people. I thought that was great. And it's perfect because that's what motivates Tahani to do something. Is when people don't think that she's good enough. So she's very motivated by negative reinforcement. You know, people saying, you're not good enough. Try harder. Tahani's like, okay, I will. I you will don't deserve this. Harder. Yes, I do. Yeah, exactly. I'll show you. Whereas other people, you know, positive reinforcement is what works for them, right? So I like that he's got a different strategy for Tahani. I think that's, it shows that he knows her. Yes. Yeah. Although that does kind of keep her on the track of just doing things to prove other people wrong. But hopefully along the way, she'll make some changes. So let's go to our last member of Team Cockroach. Michael talks to Jason under the name of Zach Pizzazz and offers him a spot on a dance crew in Australia. Jason refuses and he tells Michael about his tough year training for a dance competition. After nearly suffocating to death, Jason decides to focus all of his efforts on winning this dance competition. He leaves behind a life of crime while he eats, sleeps, and vapes dance. After running out of money, Jason returns to petty crime, and Michael tells him about a group of people searching for meaning, and he offers to take him there. And Jason agrees. First of all, Manny Jacinto looking buff as heck in this episode. <laughs> Whoa, dude like worked out in between seasons, I swear. Because he's like, his veins are just popping out everywhere. And he's got a really nice haircut. He's He looks really good. Maybe he's going to take off his shirt this season. Oh my goodness. I don't know if I'm prepared for that. Is America prepared for that? He's already attractive enough. Let's just, anyway. Also, great dance moves. He's a really good dancer. I know that's part of why he was chosen to be Jason. Like part of why he was selected is because he had that talent. Um, So I'm really glad we did get to see it. That was fun. And not just in a small moment of him dancing to EDM in season one. We got to see him actually like strut some moves, which is cool. And I do like the beginning of his dance with him stumbling out of the safe. And I thought that was cool. I kind of wish we had seen more of it. Like it wasn't so chopped up because it would have been interesting to see is Jason actually really good at choreography and making like a story out of a dance Mm -hmm. because it really felt like the story was there. And then we kind of got like little bits and pieces. And then I felt like we lost the story. Like maybe there was more of it that they had to cut for the episode. Yeah, I think so. I used to watch So You Think You Can Dance and I got really invested. And when they did like choreography that told a story. So I was like. Really excited right at the beginning, and then we lost it, and I thought, no, I want that back. Yeah. Give it to me. <laughs> um, Jason, or uh, Manny Jacinto, is actually in a big movie coming out very soon. Oh. Uh, he's in the new Top Gun movie. Very cool. So that could be part of the reason why he's getting buff. Oh, okay. And getting ripped yeah, yeah. for flying a, a jet. I mean, if they're going to have a beach volleyball scene... He's going to be shirtless. Right. So I feel like it makes sense that Jason's slower on the uptake than the rest of them. Like he doesn't see the poster that says change your life. and Because he to... sees what he wants to see. Yeah. He sees dance. He's like, I'm on it. Dance. Dance is the answer to dance my Dance my problems away uh. or throw a Molotov cocktail at it. He just never really thought that there was more to life. And I like that he sees that after he's arrested and he's talking to Pillboy and thinks i don't really have any great accomplishments and i don't really know what i'm doing with my life what am i going to be remembered as what's my legacy yeah am i going to be that guy who found a foot on the beach or can i be more than that And that's scary that's what we all think about sometimes like yeah what am i leaving behind what are people going to remember me for if anything i also like that michael is honest with jason and he gets him to do it without tricking him It's not, oh, yeah, we're going to go to this dance competition in Australia, which, of course, Jason thinks is Atlantis. It's unexpected Mm. that that's what gets him 
to Australia. That's oh, like, hey, sure. there's people that want to change their life as well. Maybe this can help you because it's not the Jason that we're used to. And I like that a lot because the Jason that we've been shown so often is just, it gets old. Mm-hmm. It does. And, and it's nice Jacinto to see. Has more to offer than that. Right. And it's just nice to see that there is, you know, some depth to his character. So we've we've heard a few of the names that Michael used this episode. We didn't get a name for the librarian. Nope. Uh, or the dude on the bike. But uh, we have we've got Charles Brain Man. Mm-hmm. Very. Which, um... It's suspicious, and Eleanor even kind of has a look of suspicion <laughs> when Chidi mentions that name. She's like, uh, "That seems." on point but okay whatever that seems like a fake name and then we've got gordon indigo yeah and zach pizzazz of course zach pizzazz gotta be my favorite yeah yeah but it's got pizzazz (laughs) i wouldn't mind seeing a few more of michael's personalities or different disguises Ah, they were they were fun to watch well if he does come back to earth which he's likely to do (laughs) i mean let's be honest (laughs) then who knows what's his What's his role going to be? Because Trevor's mm. just going as Trevor. So maybe Michael will just assume the identity of Michael the human, mm-hmm. right? We don't know. So shall we jump over to Trevor? We should jump to the end of the episode. Absolutely. Okay. Michael gifts the doorman a thermos with a cute frog picture and the doorman is delighted. The judge checks in on Michael and Janet and finds nothing amiss. The four humans are in Australia and they are joined by one last member. Duh, duh, duh. Trevor! What? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, so we've got Trevor. Is he acting? Is he planted there by Sean? Is he still evil Trevor? Or, oh yeah. 100%. 100%. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it's going to be great. He's evil. Okay. He is... So, no question about it. Yeah. Evil Trevor. That's how I feel. Yeah. He is planted by Sean. He is there to ruin the attempt at making them better people. I'm assuming he's going to just derail a lot of their progress he's gonna plant a lot of ideas in people's minds he's gonna keep trying to get everyone to take the easy way out okay i'm i'm interested to see how he interacts with everyone okay yeah what about jen so the judge comes out and Mm. right when michael comes back yeah and is kind of like hey how's it going like what's going on i'm just watching some shows just want to see what you guys are doing it seems suspicious like mm. i know what you guys are up to i'm just kind of making you feel off guard mm. i don't know i don't buy it no i don't think i don't think she is but what i'm wondering is how are they going to keep michael and janet and sean and the judge interacting with people so it doesn't feel so a story b story or like Mm-hmm. Right? Because if Michael's going back to Earth and he's interacting and interfering, okay, there you go. You've got Michael in the same scene as our four humans. But is Jen ever going to make her way Well, on Michael Earth? can't be in is the same scene Janet? as our four humans because they know him as all these different people. Eleanor oh, knows him yeah, as the bartender. That's true. Jason knows him as Zach Pizzazz. And oh, like, crap. yeah, so that. That could be a big thing. Like, I think someone's going to find out that they're the same person and then something's uh, going to click and an Eleanor is going to The whole to... memory thing. Yes, the whole oh. memory thing. What if he sends Janet as like, oh, Janet, go interfere for me. And oh. then Janet gets to go on Earth. That would be so exciting. Yes, it would. So exciting. Would she even work on Earth? Like, would Well, she Michael doesn't even work on Earth. Function is what I'm asking. Would she function? Probably. Yeah. Michael doesn't have any powers when he's on Earth. So then does Janet cease to exist? No, Janet because she doesn't couldn't. have access to all of her memory, like not her memories, but all the information. She doesn't have... That would change Janet That would change Janet wow. permanently. Okay. Because Michael is in this human body, right? Like to try and learn how to best torture humans. But Janet's body is not made of the same thing. She's not made of, you know, cells and bone and all right. this. So, I don't know. I'm interested to mm-hmm. see if she makes it on Earth. I want, like, I still want Maya Rudolph to interact with the rest of the cast. So, a big part of me wants her to find her way to Earth or something like that. I just don't want my cast separated for an entire season is basically what I'm saying. Yeah. So, well, overall, 
What do you think of the episode? Very intrigued. They've mm-hmm. laid a lot of groundwork for potential storylines and exciting possibilities. Yeah. And I'm very excited to let my mind go blank and mm-hmm. just see where they want to take me on this wild ride. Yes, absolutely. I feel like this episode was really well paced. And yet they did so much in it. Like just writing the recap out, I was like, oh my goodness, there's like a lot that happens just because we're seeing what happened with Chidi. We're seeing what happened with Tahani. We're seeing what happened with Jason. And I'm really glad that they didn't spread that out and have one episode where it was all about Chidi, one episode where it was all about Tahani, one episode all about Jason. Like, let's just get our four humans in the same room together. Let's get this show on the road. Like, we don't want to keep waiting Just like you were saying at the beginning, I don't want, you know, the whole episode to be Michael saving them. Let's just move it along. Yeah. So I'm really glad. I feel like it was very well done. I was very impressed with the episode. I I liked it a lot better than the first episode of season two, which was also a double episode. Yes. And drawn out. There was a lot of overlapping. A lot of repetition. A lot of repetition. So um, much better than that episode, in my opinion. Yes. So. Anyway. So, shall we end our episode with a quick mailbag section? I don't want to mail a thing. I don't want to bag at all because I miss you show. And I don't want to miss a thing. (laughs) All right, let's get into our mail. I hate it. (laughs) I hate it. (laughs) You love it. Shush. All right. So, our first message was from Kate at I Do Human Things on Twitter. She sent us a very long message. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I always love your very enthusiastic uh, messages. So I'm just going to pick out a couple little pieces here and there. So you mentioned that you feel like this season's going to be Michael se- Michael's season. It's going to be Michael-centric. And I kind of disagree with you on that one. I feel like season one was really Eleanor's journey. And season two was very much Michael's journey. Like, it was Michael becoming a better person um, and him really learning and growing. So I feel like this season is honestly everyone's season. Like, this is finally the time where no one is in the spotlight. So if they do that, they cannot reboot it again. Oh, I really hope They can't reset everybody. I don't want it again. Nope. I think, honestly, they'd lose viewers because you start to become less invested in the characters because you're just thinking, well, maybe they're just going to reset them again. So why am I getting invested in anybody if they're just going to delete them? Yeah, that's kind of how I started feeling at the beginning of season two. And then I was glad to see that we shut that down quickly. But if it had gone any longer in season two, I would have started to get worried. (laughs) No, I agree with you about this season being everyone's season. And that's how Mm -hmm. I felt after the end of the episode. Like, we've got everybody together. We've gone through what everyone went through over those few months, over the year. And it's time for everyone to start working together. And it's actually having them all together this way is better than when they were all together in season two. Mm -hmm. Because... They were still off being fake tortured and Michael and Eleanor and Chidi felt a lot more buddy buddy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how I feel about the season. I'm I'm hopeful that it will be about everyone and everyone changing, Um, especially I feel like Tahani and Jason. I need to see more from them. I need to see more growth from them because I still feel like they're lacking in that department and the characters that have grown the most on this show are Eleanor and Michael. And I want more from the rest of the cast. Um, Because I think they're great. And I need to see it to love them a little more in a way. Yeah, they've kind of been sidelined. Yeah. So another thing that Kate brought up um, was Michael's interfering. She said, I'm sure you'll both have thoughts without prompting when it comes to what drives Michael here. Is he truly good just because he found some people that he loves and believes in? I think we can all agree that his meddling here is kind of taking a few steps backwards in terms of moral growth. First off, he doesn't need Chidi to tell him that his meddling destroys the validity of this experiment. Second, these are not the actions of good person, but they are the actions of a well-intentioned person. 
And sadly for him and our sometimes well-intentioned people back on Earth, that's not going to be enough for the good place. So you bring up something interesting. I wasn't really thinking about Michael's motivations. Uh, So thank you actually for this question for prompting us. Michael is doing this out of a selfish desire, really. Like he loves these people. He wants good things for them, but he's not allowing them to make those things happen on their own. Yeah, he's nudgy nudging them. Yeah, he just just, just nudgy 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 a little bit. Um, By the way, Ted Danson says nudge in a weird way that I kind of loved. I don't know. Does Do you feel like it's him taking a few steps backwards in terms of moral growth? I think he's getting off the rail. I think what what's happening with Michael is he's getting so caught up in his experiments and doing things and instead of just letting things happen, mm-hmm. taking his hands off the reins and just letting these people become better person, better people. He just likes doing things and also he's doing a bad thing so it's kind of like oh i'm being kind of naughty by running this experiment (laughs) right under their noses so this is kind of exciting and thrilling and that's true yeah it's new people don't do it right yeah i feel like michael is a control freak he just can't let it go he can't let things play out how they play out he needs them to be back together again because i feel like His motivations are not entirely pure good, but I don't feel like he's all of a sudden a horrible person again. He's not acting like a complete demon. He is trying to do something good. He's just interfering way too much. And his interference did cause Sean to be able to place Trevor in the in the real world. So there are consequences to your actions, Michael. You are going to have to deal with that this season. And you bring up the point about this never really being good enough for the good place, right? Being well-intentioned, but not actually being a capital G, capital P, good person. Michael was also asking to be sent to the good place too, right? He was advocating for himself as well. So maybe he feels like, if this doesn't work, like I'm also going to go to the bad place and I'm going to get either retired or put in a unmarked room with a bunch of New Yorker magazines, <laughs> both of which sounds awful. So mm. it could be kind of, yeah, selfishly motivated for sure. Kate brings up another point. Um, she says, I have many ideas stirring regarding the hijinks and hardships that Michael has faced when traveling in the mortal rel- realm playing butterfly effect. Like, it's not like he's affecting our world. He's created a whole new branch of reality. A whole new timeline, So it doesn't even matter how much he's changing because he's not changing things. He's just living his life. Suddenly, Chidi isn't dead anymore. It's just he never was dead Mm. in this reality. So it's... He's not... I think I'm explaining this poorly because he is changing how things happened in there in our character's reality. But he's not changing everyone's lives because... Their lives are now this. They right. never were anything else. Okay. So you don't feel like there's a butterfly effect going on here? It's it's so hard to say because it's not time travel. It's no. not. That's true. It's just. It's a new timeline. Yeah. It's, it's a brand new timeline yeah, okay. where everything is blank up to those moments where our characters died. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you so much, Kate, for your messages. I really love getting them. Um, please continue to write them, even if they're not concise. I just think it's great. Thank you. Our next message comes from our friend Allie at AllieCT on Twitter. And she asked, how do I feel about Simone and Chidi? And I pretty much answer that. Mm -hmm. I think that they're very cute together. I do like them as a couple. I feel like Simone is good for Chidi because she's so straightforward and decisive and... Being a scientist is just so different from being a moral philosopher. So I feel like they balance each other out in a nice way. Mm -hmm. I kind of hope they don't last the entire season, but I don't want it to be because of Eleanor interfering or there's like some sort of cheating storyline like that. I just, I don't want that to happen. But you know, with Trevor, you never know. Is he going to influence Eleanor to do something? Or is he going to be like, Hey, Simone, did you know that Chidi and Eleanor banged? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. They I really just... went to pound town that one time. Yeah. So 
I'm kind of hoping it just naturally fizzes out in some sort of way because I do want Chidi and Eleanor together. They are my end game here. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't mind seeing Eleanor and Tahani this season. Like at least that kind of idea explored, like something flirtation, proper flirtation where it's not just, Oh, wouldn't you love to see stone cold Steve Austin's head on Tahani's body or vice versa. Like those are all cute little moments, but Make Eleanor a little more gay. Go for it. And Ali also asks, how do I feel now that the show has implied that it's not a simulation? I don't know how I feel about that. Mm. Because it just felt like too huge of a ch- of an adjustment for the show. Like mm. suddenly we can, we've gone from there being a quote unquote heaven and hell, which sure I can buy that, to all of a sudden we can bring people back from the dead or make people never die. Or, you know, it just seems like a huge change that suddenly they can do. Is it the idea of the fact that they can affect something on Earth that's bothering you? Like, does that feel too big? Yeah, because that completely defeats... Like, it's not their realm. Right. Like, Earth is not their realm. The afterlife is their they realm. They shouldn't be able to... That completely demolishes free will, doesn't it? Mm. And the sense of our decisions you know, shape our life. We should be able to choose. I mean, that was the whole foundation of like Christianity, Mm -hmm. right? Like God doesn't, God doesn't uh, manipulate man. He learned that after the old Testament. So Mm. no more interfering in the new Testament. God's like, Nope, it's out of my hands. No changing things. (laughs) Man does what man does. But now we can be manipulated and, and played like pawns on a chessboard. Right. We're no longer our own selves. Oh, so Jason. I don't know how I feel about that. You bring up so many implications. Oh my goodness. Ugh. I don't be thinking about that. I know. Plus also, I'm just going to be like looking for demons in my real life. I can think of a few. <laughs> um, yeah. Allie's next question was, what are your hopes for Janet this season? I hope she becomes awesome and gets with Jason and they have Janet Jason babies. Too much. (laughs) I know robot Janet Jason babies would be adorable and probably not really possible. Not smart enough to not go on The Bachelor. I think Janet and Jason are destined to be together forever. No matter what reality we're in, they should be together. That's cute. They're your end game. Yes. Your OTP? Sure. Okay. I haven't really thought about what my hopes are for Janet this season. She was off to me in this episode, but I feel like that's just the beginning. I feel like she's going to change a lot this season, and I'm very excited to see where it goes. I really want her to somehow make her way onto Earth. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of my hope for her right now. I'm not thinking too far ahead, I guess. I'm just thinking. Well, the implications of that are so exciting. Oh, yeah, for sure. I want her on Earth. I want her back with Team Cockroach because I feel like her and Michael are great together. But I don't want Darcy Carden to be limited to just playing with one actor. I want her to play with the whole rainbow. And by that, I mean Eleanor. Um, (laughs) So, yes, thank you very much for your questions, Allie. I like Garrett's comment to Allie's question. I can't really reply because the no swearing covenant. Yeah, I'm guessing Garrett has some uh, different feelings about Simone and Chidi that I do. That's fair. Please send me those. I need to hear it. It's fine. It's fine if you have a different opinion. Or at least meme them to us. Meme them. Or gif them to us. Gif them, as Eleanor would say. We're not talking about that. Yeah. We went over that. Yeah, no, not talking about it. Okay. And our last question comes from at Public Patty. And Public Patty asked, Michael needed papers to get to Earth. How did Trevor get there? Possibilities, papers, easy to forge. Two, uh, found a back door. Three, judges in on it. Or four, something else. Those are some interesting possibilities. I feel like Trevor managed to get there. I'm not really sure how because... I feel like this dark hallway probably has other doors and Sean found his way through another door. I don't feel like Sean found 
a way for Trevor to get into the judges' chambers and then somehow get by Michael and Janet standing right next to the door and then past the doorman and then into Earth. I feel like there had to be a way for him to just boom, get to that hallway, get to the doorman, bypass him entirely, either take the key or just the doorman was so distracted by the mug. I don't think that the judge is in on it. I really feel like Jen is genuine. Um, That's my opinion. Yeah. Let us know what you think. Maybe you have different ideas. I like this idea, though. Like, the judge is in on it. I never would have even considered that as a possibility. Well, another thing to mention about the doorman is he doesn't seem to have any way to communicate with his superiors. No, he's not checking in with... There's no intercom. There's no phone line. There's just a buzzer, a Mm nameplate, a keychain, which, again, I'll mention, he keeps plain in plain sight on his desk. Mm Mm-hmm. And there's the ink pad and stamp. And I guess he's just very trustworthy. Because yeah. he's just keeps everything out in the open. And nothing's going to get past him because he's literally right in front of the door. Yeah. But maybe his infatuation with frogs is going to be his downfall. Maybe. We'll find out next episode. Woo! I'm maybe. so excited. Okay. So thank you very much for joining us for our first episode of season three. That will bring us to the end of Forking Bullshirt, a multiverse radio production. If you like the show, please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. This is the best way for others to find the show. And if you want to get in touch with us, we're on Twitter at Multiverse Radio and on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. And you can also send us your rambly thoughts over on our website at multiverseradio.ca. Where we've recently revamped our podcast section so it looks all nice and fancy. Oh yeah, go check it out. Jason did a really nice job. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. The fuel. Let's get right into the bloopers, (laughs) Right into the bloopers. Okay. Cold Steve Cold Austin, whatever. (laughs) Don't call Steve Austin. Steve Cold (laughs) Austin. (laughs) Shush. Okay. Um, My one trick pony. <laughs> That's not what that means. One Drew Barry. Anyway. One Drew Barrymore? One Drew Barrymore. Chidi. <laughs> Chidi. 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 Ch- Chidi. Cheddar tells Eleanor. <laughs> the Cheddar Goblin tells Eleanor. Uh, okay.